so uh, good morning. Uh, this is the second talk in the advance of uh, Croatia, so we're here. And we're very happy to have with us today uh, Misha Serpo from Kosala National Lab. Uh, Misha is what uh, we used to envy, right? I mean, we used to, uh, the old times here, talk about uh, Russian people, how they were educated in mathematics, physics, and so on and so forth, and why they were doing such great work in uh, information theory and control and all that stuff. Uh, so he's a prime example of that. He, uh, he uh, got his PhD in physics in the Wildman Institute. And then after his PhD, uh, he spent three years in Princeton as a Dickey Fellow in Paramount Physics, which is very uh, distinguished. Then he joined the uh, Los Alamos Lab in 1999 as an Oppenheimer Fellow. For those of you who know history, Oppenheimer was essentially created in the Los Alamos Lab. And then uh, he um, now he's a technical staff member. He has uh, two large groups, one in the physics of algorithms and one in optimization and control theory of smart grids. Proving the point that if you start with good background in physics and mathematics, you can do many, many interesting things. Since I'm a professor, I have to give you a bit of a teaching statement. So we're very happy he's here, and today he's, uh, he's actually been here yesterday, and we had an interesting uh, update for the afternoon, and he's going to be on the about four thirty here. If you want to meet him, he's available. Um, and he's going to talk today about physics of arguments, belief propagation, and beyond. So, uh, Dear Marjan, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's very uh, nice uh, well, to be here. It's very interesting discussion yesterday, and I'm looking forward to continue uh, today. And uh, even though it is colloquial, it will go over the high level, but please don't be subject to ask questions. And uh, yeah, I'll be very happy to, to answer. And John said, uh, I'm, I'm physicist by training and I still believe I'm doing physics, even though for me it's you know, application of my knowledge and uh, statistical physics. And uh, well, uh, just to introduce myself briefly, I to put the slide uh, and also to tell you uh, my past to the subject, which, which is a bit strange for somebody with a physics background. I indeed was trained in you know, classical condensed matter physics, uh, then was doing another subject statistical physics, or theoretical physics, which is called statistical hydrodynamics. And believe it or not, some of it will be kind of used in this talk uh, in terms of uh, applications, certain type of application. And then I came to Los Alamos, and at Los Alamos, it is very, uh, Los Alamos is a big national lab. We have uh, a lot of uh, different uh, expertise uh, present, maybe physics, chemistry, computer science, engineering. Uh, and what is very encouraging is the uh, cross-disciplinary discussion that I found myself, I, I, didn't, I didn't expect for myself to do that type of thing, but I love it and that's more or less what, what I keep doing since then. So first it was fiber optics as an application. So fiber optics I got into some information theory questions and then these graphical models which, which will be the main subject of this talk pop up. I kind of forgot about motivation, <laughs> original motivation for myself. I, I, I came into this information theory uh, subject uh, with an idea that, well, I understand fiber, fiber channel. And uh, those information series or coding series, they, they use a couple of very simple models of a channel. Uh, I know much better how you know, it's not real, it's not realistic. And of course, uh, after some years, I discovered that, well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of sense in using these very simple channels. And I, I started to do that type of thing. More, more, more standard uh, in coding series. It's more than coding series than information series. And actually, it will be discussed in this talk. Uh, and uh, it uh, percolated into computer science. Uh, and there are many other disciplines where this uh, graphical models, which is a main theoretical tool. Uh, and for that matter, belief propagation is an algorithm, but also as a way of uh, describing uh, certain approximation, but also a way of thinking about graphical models. Where it is extremely uh, useful and powerful, and that's maybe one of the messages of this talk. Uh, so, this uh, power grids, I'll not be discussing it in this talk, uh, but it's really a very cool application, for, especially for those of you who uh, students that are looking for a good application for your knowledge in communications, uh, systems, uh, systems research. Uh, I really encourage you to, to look at it, and uh, for that matter, uh, I'll be very happy to discuss it offline. Okay, so now uh, 
you, you probably already sense what to expect from me, so it will be um, yeah, so playing back and forth between algorithms and physics. Uh, so it will be kind of two examples and uh, not, not, not exactly, but one of them will be going more from uh, physics to algorithms and another one going backwards using algorithms in, in, in some physics applications. And uh, as already said, there are many other disciplines that, uh, which, which supposedly already benefiting from this, this type of uh, way of thinking and uh, overall well, one of the main messages I guess is that this is the discipline is stuff and playing in the you know, application theory and using statistical uh, statistical way of thinking is fun it's very, very productive so I, uh, in, in a way of how I plan to organize this talk uh, so I'll first tell you about two seemingly unrelated problems. One of them, of course, I, I'm assuming very, very much known to this audience. Uh, it will be error correction and specifically suboptimal decoding and uh, what is called error flow and problem figuring out the error flow. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. And then uh, I'll switch gears, I'll tell you about another problem, which is probably much less known. It's motivated by fluid mechanics application, physics application. And uh, uh, there, you know, on, a, on a superficial level, well, they are not related, but uh, there is some uh, language, uh, common language, which we can use for, to kind of solve, crack, at least to, to degree both of those problems, and that's uh, what, what I, what I uh, will be explaining in the second part, which is theoretical, but uh, it will be relatively high level. I'll not go into many details, what exactly, just giving you maybe a little bit of intuition, a little bit of uh, uh, relations. So that's what we call now um, graphical models, uh, common language. Uh, there are common questions uh, like computing, counting, and uh, inference, uh, and uh, overall stating it all as a certain type of optimization. Uh, continuous optimization uh, as an approximation, but originally it's, it's a fundamental optimization problem. Uh, right, so it will be uh, in a kind of part of this talk and then uh, I'll come back, I'll return back to those two applications and we'll, we'll tell you very briefly what you can get with this technique or for that matter where where uh, we're going for to I mean what, what, what the direction for us to explore. So one of them as I already said is more where it collect went from physics towards algorithms towards uh, uh, algorithms for uh, finding uh, figuring out what the special uh, events which are responsible for a flow are and in another, it will be uh, how algorithms can help to solve this particle safety problem. In, 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 in real applications, it's called particle visualization. Okay, so, uh, uh, well, I guess I'll be a little bit preaching as we go. So it's error correction. I'm, I'm sure the majority of people in this audience know this much better than myself. Uh, very schematically, uh, and not discussing specific application where it's used, uh, there are three main ingredients uh, in, uh, in terms of practical design of a, of a call. Uh, first of all, there is a channel, and uh, you start thinking about error correction in the first place because you're not happy with the performance of the channel. You formulate this performance in terms of probability of error, and if this probability of error is large enough, let's say 10 minus 3, bitter array is 10 minus 3, you're not happy with this bitter array, you want to make it low, and for that you use coding. Uh, encoding itself consists on, well, again, oversimplifying it, and uh, two components, list of components. One is encoding, which shall not be discussed. I'll be assuming that this encoding is already done for me, and I'll be using what, what will be, what, what we call graphical codes, or LDPC code density package. And then there is a part which is the focus of my discussion, which is the decoding. And decoding is mainly about algorithm, about finding, um, reconstructing, so it's a reconstruction problem. So, and uh, that's, 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 that's what I'll be discussing. Uh, right, so I already said that it will be a story which mainly applies to low density parameter code, but actually uh, this part, uh, low density part, uh, well, uh, can be, uh, in some cases, can be, uh, we, we can go to dense codes, and, uh, uh, but we need to have some graphical representation. Uh, and, uh, well, that is uh, graphical representation, of course, is, uh, 
for example, uh, present that and the purpose of this talk is primarily uh, prime example uh, that's a standard graph, standard graph of code which expresses uh, uh, relations between variables which is sent to the channel, uh, which is already redundant, and <coughs> check nodes, right? So in this case, there are 10 variables, there are five checks, and uh, this graph represents uh, those constraints. The <coughs> checks which are connected to respective nodes express uh, this part of the check and uh, <coughs> formally uh, over it. Addressing semantics of the graph is nothing but uh, part of check matrix. And uh, when we say that the graph is, uh, when we're discussing LTPC codes, uh, we need to emphasize that this graph is also responsive graph. <coughs> Fewer uh, ones than zeros, right? And well, even though it doesn't look like a tree, that's a particular code which, uh, which we love to play. It's, it's called Tanner code. It has a length of 125 bits and uh, having distance is 20. It doesn't look sparse, but in fact it is. Uh, I mean, uh, and the sparseness means in this case that. Uh, Degree of connectivity for any node uh, is um, relatively small. Uh, of course, we yes. Uh, so, uh, I'm very familiar with this. Area. <coughs> are the the checks are they transmitted separately, like checks? Uh, well, in this uh, in this case, I mean, to uh, those checks uh, are not transmitted. So, what is transmitted are those variables, and checks are just uh, representing a relation between. And uh, so what you, uh, you transmit, uh, so you first apply, um, you have a generator matrix, uh, uh, which, which, which you can also reconstruct from this parity check matrix. You apply generator matrix to your message, um, your code word, which you want to transmit. Uh, you're getting this uh, uh, vector, which you're actually sending to the channel, those 10 bits in this case. And the relation between those 10 bits are expressed. Uh, it's convenient to express them in this form in a kind of inverse form to a degree, which is, which is called, yeah, so this parity check function. Uh, right, uh, okay, and that, that's actually a matrix in the presentation of this graph. Uh, sparseness is a very kind of useful thing uh, in LTPC world, and that's actually really important for, for the purpose of it. And now I mentioned already that I, I'm, I'm mainly focused on reconstructing, on the decoding. So what is decoding? Again, in a very kind of high-level high description. I sent uh, this uh, code word, um, uh, right? I sent it to a noisy channel. And now uh, I'm already on another side of the channel, right? So I uh, I do have information about this transition probability. So I know that that's, that's what it means, noisy no channel, right? But I, of course, uh, it's not deterministic uh, uh, processes, stochastic process. I know only probability, not, not not convenient image. So I forgot this uh, original code word. So now I want to reconstruct. So it's a corrupted data. And uh, what I should do, I should do inference, right? Statistical inference. And uh, I uh, aim to find a possible pre image. Uh, and of course, I may be wrong in doing this reconstruction, but what, what I, what, how I phrase it, I phrase it as a maximum likelihood problem. Uh, it's the best I can do under all this uncertainty. Um, so uh, I basically want, ideally, want to go through the list of those possible code words and uh, calculate, maximize this prob transition probability. And, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry, it's misprint. So it's a uh, uh, X condition to, uh, to sigma. And I want to maximize, I want to find this most probable code word. So that's what maximum, maximum like. Of course, you need to recognize that uh, this task is, is not feasible in general. Uh, and uh, it's not feasible for those LTPC codes, so complexity of this computation, of course, is exponential. And then the whole, uh, you know, uh, it, it starts uh, all those other considerations. Well, just in passing, I want to mention there are other, other characteristics which you may want to calculate. Instead of reconstructing this code word, we want to know what is the probability of having this particular bit in this in state 0, 1, and that's also a useful quantity. Calculate it, and it's still very difficult to calculate that if you if you want exact reconstruction, exact probability reconstruction. So the point is that it's not feasible to do that. So now we what what we what we do uh, we do uh, so LTPC codes are good because uh, they have uh, good uh, approximate coding. So 
So we substitute, we create uh, optimality for efficiency, and then we have very good decoding, which is called message passing decoding, and that's uh, iterative uh, algorithm, uh, which is very much related to this concept of belief propagation, which I've been describing. And uh, so uh, interesting piece of this LDPC code, the history of that, is that uh, LDPC codes uh, actually did introduced first uh, without knowing that they are very good. Uh, uh, it, this knowledge came much later, but uh, they were introduced because decoding was efficient. Because, and the uh, main idea, because the simplicity of decoding is so decoding is, is related to tree structure. And so that will be, will be important for, for, for all the discussions which I'll go through. I put here some number of uh, buzzwords which uh, usually comes with uh, when people are discussing efficiency of a code, how good is a code. Uh, just, just for reference, I'll not be going into any of those subjects. I will be discussing. Uh, I'll not be discussing how we use this coding as a phase transition problem, even though phase transition is about the terminology coming from physics. Even though it is phase transition between uh, a situation where you cannot decode without errors, a situation when you can decode uh, error-free in an asymptotic sense, in the sense of uh, infinite. So what you see in here is uh, the standard curve, which which we show uh, so frame error rate, error rate versus signal to noise ratio, and uh, in black is a capacity curve. So it's a Shannon curve. It's what Shannon uh, told us uh, uh, we uh, can achieve in theory, but he didn't give us a uh, code, right? So uh, you cannot do better than that. You cannot uh, find yourself uh, with a realistic code somewhere in this. In corner, but you're somewhat right. So what was remarkable about LTPC codes is that um, you, well, uh, one point of Shannon's here is that uh, not only that it's, uh, you know, uh, that we have this curve, but also uh, that it is threshold behavior. So that's what is called the false phase transition. So basically, when signal to noise ratio is larger than certain, certain value, then uh, in a, for very long codes, you decode uh, without errors uh, in asymptotic now, a remarkable thing about all DPC codes, what you see in red, in blue, and in green, in red, it's uh, some uh, special family of all DPC codes, and blue is a group of codes, and in green is yet another family of all uh, DPC codes, and it's uh, asymptotic statements. So they are not as good as uh, this capacity uh, estimation, but still, uh, you're getting this asymptote statement. So if you're on the left from this red, uh, red point, you perform error-free uh, for this, uh, for this, uh, for this LDPC code, this uh, um, the propagation decoding message class. Okay, and now uh, here we are coming a little bit closer to, uh, so it, it was very good, right, to, to have this nice uh, synthetic curves, but when you start dealing with a uh, uh, finite size, finite code, uh, you're not getting a symptom, right? You're getting uh, some curves, and that's the same, uh, the same type of uh, values you blow, so it's error rate, uh, frame rate, and bit error rate versus signal to noise ratio. And uh, we have those two uh, regimes which are observed. First, you see this what is called waterfall, and then there is error flow. So it's, it's change in performance. That's a result of simulations, right? So you run me, and uh, those different colors are for different types of code. So this is built for many codes from uh, basically random codes with given degrees in this. Uh, parity check matrix, and uh, those are uh, some uh, special um, families, of course, are already expurgated, so optimized. So uh, but in, in any event, you see uh, that uh, there is this waterfall, uh, which is a nice, and you know, basically, you would fall down, you would think, if, if, if you, if you, if you uh, in your simulations, access this range, you would never guess that it will start to be much less pleasant than what you, what you, what you hope it will be. We hope that it will go down, but actually it flattens. That's what we call error flow. And, the, uh, and then error flow will be, uh, um, be expected uh, because of suboptimality of decoding. In other words, uh, for the self DPC code, if it would be to continue, uh, if it would be to do maximum likelihood decoding, yes, such You know, I know about message passing, but some of my neighbors are asking what that is. Would it be possible to explain? <laughs> I, I, I'm coming to that. Okay. So it's actually, I'm, 
I'm trying to, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, can, can we postpone it just for, for five minutes? I, I'll certainly get to that. <laughs> That's the whole, whole point of this talk, actually. Uh, belief propagation, message passing, is a realization of belief propagation. Uh, so, message passing algorithm will be suboptimal decoding. So, it's a replacement for this maximum likelihood decoding. And uh, suboptimality shows itself in the theorems, in, in the emergence of the cell block. That's, that's a point of this slide. And another point is that it might happen actually very low in terms of probability. So you see numbers here, they're not that bad, they're not that low, 10 minus 5, 10 minus 6. 10 minus 6, uh, if you do kind of Monte Carlo type of simulations, you just test the performance of code. You can, you can see this change. But imagine that the error flow happens much lower, and the longer the code, the lower it will, it will be. Um, and here we have uh, this task of finding a way of getting to the error flow. Getting in the sense that just you know, getting an end for given code, for given decoding, decoding the suboptimals, uh, try to uh, estimate in, in real world uh, uh, asymptotic of this bit error rate curve. And uh, asymptotic being uh, the signal to noise ratio is very, well, sufficiently large. Uh, and uh, that's, that's more or less the task which I'll be, which, which, be, which got us into the subject and that's what I'll be discussing. And of course, I'll tell you what, what several things are going to All right, uh, so basically one point which I'll be emphasizing is that you need an efficient method to analyze the set of flow. This is a rare event analysis which you need to do. Uh, and the type of uh, theory and algorithm which you'll be developing is that uh, it's based more or less on large deviation type of ideas. Uh, and that, that, that's what, what, I, what I hope to do that. Now, uh, Changing the subject a little bit, uh, and I, yeah, I'll come to the location. Trust me. <laughs> so I, uh, I'll, I'll give you a completely different application where the same message passing, same bit of propagation, actually would, would be also very useful. Uh, and uh, here is, uh, well, if, if it will show, it may not yet. Here we go. Okay, um, it's a. Uh, movie uh, which my experimental colleague from Los Alamos is from Go Back Lab. Okay. So what they do, uh, they study turbulence in two-dimensional flows. So it's a turbulence which you haven't seen like. And uh, you don't see the flow normally. Uh, and the way to visualize the flow is to see the particles. Uh, your task is not to reconstruct where a particle, individual particle would go. So here you have a movie and you see how particles move. But imagine that you have a sequence of snapshots. And that's what, what, what it is. And there are many particles. And then uh, you, you would say that one task is to see where a particle in one image uh, end up being in the second image. But uh, in fact, what is your actual task is to reconstruct the velocity field which you can see. The velocity is a continuous, continuous, uh, continuous field which basically attracts those particles. And that's, that's what, what the original task is. So in, in, in words, uh, you want to learn the flow uh, from those particles. And uh, I'll be uh, describing uh, a bit simplified task. When you have just two snapshots, you have two images. And uh, possibly, uh, well, let's say those greens, they were in the first image, and those reds are in the second image. And uh, maybe that says what actually happens. So this particle moved here, this particle moved there. But uh, of course, it may also be the matching is different. So you obviously have this uh, uh, n factorial uh, number of possible matchings. Uh, well, probably not all n factorial are equally probable, so there is some probability assigned. Uh, and uh, you can uh, formulate this task which I was telling you about in terms of matching. But in fact, it's not your actual task, because uh, it's not enough for you just to find matching. Right? So what you want, you want to reconstruct the flow. So that's what I'll be discussing. Discuss. It is, as I already mentioned in the very beginning, related to a technique which is called particle emission asymmetry. This technique is optics technique. It came with fast cameras and uh, mostly young uh, discipline. Uh, very instrumental, very practical. Uh, there are, well, there are good, good instruments, there are good algorithms, but all of them, all existing algorithms, they're basically based on the following um, following assumption. Uh, oh, that's a logic. Uh, 
uh, which, which is behind those, those heads. They basically want to uh, make exposition uh, uh, as uh, short as possible. Uh, and uh, of course, if you have it too short, you have too many images, too much of data, they don't want it. But uh, their guiding principle is you separate those images in terms of time as much as to avoid uh, overlap between variables. Okay? Uh, and uh, well, you pay a price for that, right? So there are, if you put more particles, there are a lot of those snapshots which you need to store. And uh, well, this Bob Becker, who is my experimental colleague, uh, he, he's a experimentalist and he's hiring postdocs to do, well, experiments supposedly, but they end up being doing data processing. And that's, that was kind of interesting uh, observation which he made and he was asking people like me and others, well, if you can help. And help, um, which we, we thought would be maybe possible and useful, uh, is a help which, which this community can provide. Which is, uh, let's allow particle to overlap. Let's uh, assume that there'll be, uh, let's not focus on this uh, one possible matching in you know, the only candidate. Let's uh, allow a lot of overlap. Uh, but put intelligence into reconstruction, in uh, reconstruction velocity. Try to learn velocity. Well, and uh, th that's what we've been doing. That's, uh, that's a team, and this is a kind of proceedings of the National Academy. And um, uh, yeah, so the idea is take few snapshots, let particles overlap, put extra efforts into learning inference, and use, okay, I, of course, need to use some information from physics to be able to do it. In the uh, actual PIV technique now, they don't put any physics uh, in reconstruction, right? It's just, you know, as close as possible. Um, in terms of time frames, and well, you just know where particle move. And now what I'm saying, I'm saying that uh, I kind of know equations of motion. I know uh, stochastic equations of motion, which you will see on the next slide. Uh, and there are some number of coefficients which I want to reconstruct in those equations. So let me try to, to pose it as a first name. Yes. Have you tried to do something Eulerian, like the uh PIV, or? I'm like trying to do PIV, and it will be Lagrangian. So we are very happy. Uh, I'm, I'm basically uh, talking about developing smart algorithm for, uh, yeah. for, for new, well, next generation PV. <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, uh, right, and uh, so my smartness uh, enters in our school. Uh, we, we need to put some model assumptions, and these assumptions uh, basically come from physics, so how we understand physics uh, in this case is. Uh, uh, what actually happens with this particle when it moves. So I have those two uh, images, right? So I, if I now focus on one particle, particle do, well, Brownian motion, right? Because there, are, there is certainly diffusion, there is certainly uncertainty. And uh, this is roughly, well, not roughly, that's a kind of model which we took uh, in this first test. It's a, a dynamical model of what, what we, what we, what we uh, expect from particle uh, to behave in between those two snapshots. So it's a time derivative of this position. R is a position in two or three dimension if you're talking about reconstructing two dimensional forwards and two if we're talking about reconstruction three dimensional forwards, three dimensional. And now uh, there is a Brownian motion, right? So those kicks which, which particle is getting because, because if you increase a certain temperature. And uh, there is also velocity. Velocity is an advection. Uh, is, uh, is a leading term. Uh, so basically, we here we assume that my velocity field is smooth, especially smooth, and it is frozen in terms of uh, in terms of time dependence. So in between those two snapshots, it doesn't change. The Eulerian picture of velocity doesn't change. But of course, my particle will move in certain way, and uh, uh, it's incompressible. That, that's usually incompressibility means that this matrix in here uh, uh, creates zero. And that's uh, what, what lunch event, what diffusion, diffusion means. So it's a stochastic problem, right? So now uh, let me pose it formally. What is my task? My task is learning parameters of the flow. Uh, parameters of the flow uh, are uh, parameter, uh, well, this what we call velocity gradient, shear, S, and then diffusion coefficient. So basically, it's in, in the case of two dimensional flow, it's just four parameters. You may know diffusion, you may not know diffusion. And there are uh, three components of this gray, of this matrix, and it's uh, traceless two by two matrix. So it's a relatively low dimensional uh, parameterization of my stochastic uh, uh, motion. And what I have uh, as input, I have positions of my identical particles at uh, frame zero, 
then I have positions of my particle in frame one, and uh, I want to reconstruct uh, output most probable values of this flow parameters and diffusion coefficient. Uh, that, that's in general. Of course, subtask for me would be uh, this matching, perfect matching problem. If I know this uh, parameters of my flow and diffusion coefficient, then uh, I have a reconstruction problem. Most probable matching, that's what I want to find. Uh, obviously, I'm more interested in that in learning, but it's important to appreciate that it's matching, finding matching is also important. Okay, so now, uh, both of those problems. Okay, here, uh, here I had a graph, right? And it's fully connected by partite graph. Right? Because that's graph expressing possible relations between my particles in the first image and the second image. That's in the, in the second application. The first application was parity check matrix. It shows the represented relations between my, 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 my variables. So now, uh, in, in both of those uh, programs, I'm uh, discussing inference, reconstruction. So let me now uh, go into this a little bit abstract world of reconstruction and tell you about belief propagation and the message passing uh, as algorithms for solving this reconstruction problem. Um, I basically, uh, in, well, I'm using here what we uh, in coding series, what is called Borney style representation of, of relations. And uh, in a very general setting, what I, the problem which I have is as follows. So I have a uh, certain graph, uh, and I have variables which are binary variables which sits on edges of this graph. Uh, in the case of uh, matching between those two images, I have a bi bipartite graph, and it's fully connected bipartite graph. And my, my variables are uh, sitting on possible uh, on edges which express possible relations between particles in first image and second. So when uh, this variable which sits on a certain edge is zero, it means that for sure, those two particles which this edge connects are not related. They're basically not, not coming from the same project. Okay? Uh, and now, uh, for any configuration of those uh, possible uh, uh, variables, uh, sigma, which are discrete variables defined on any edge of my graph, I have a probability assignment. In the case of coding, this probability is entering through uh, output of my channel. So information complete configuration of output. Uh, it defines those functions f, which are associated with vertexes of my graph. In the case of uh, matching, in the case of uh, tracking, uh, those, those functions, they are related to, uh, to this physical model and to those pr uh, parameters which I, I want to reconstruct in the end, they are entering in those functions. Uh, okay? So for any configuration, and there are exponentially many configurations, exponentially many in terms of the size of this graph, and size would be to measure, let's say, the number of edges. Uh, for any configuration, I have a probability, which I know explicitly. Moreover, uh, I know it is factorized, and that's why we call it factor graph. It is factorized into product. And usually, well, in both encoding and in the, in the particle tracking application, it's, it expresses uh, um, well, it expresses the origin of, of my data and expresses a uh, lack of correlations between different, uh, different pieces of data. And, uh, but in any case, uh, there is this product of uh, what we call factor functions. And now there is this interesting uh, object which enters, which in physics is called partition function. Yes, sir. <coughs> so in the case of, of uh, particle uh, flow, does this mean that you're assuming that particles kind of moving in the center of each other? Uh, well, there, uh, I, I was showing this equation of motion, and that's the assumption which I'm making about how particles are moving. Uh, so S is deterministic, but I don't know it. I want to learn it. But suppose I know it. Uh, then there is this Xi, which is expressed. Well, it's basically Brownian motion, stochastic, stochastic. Uh, uh, yes, so there is some, certain characteristics which enter this equation that are independent. And that uh, translates into uh, factorization. Uh, uh, okay, so now I'll be focusing uh, in this discussion mainly on calculating this partition function, which is the normalization <coughs> coefficient. Uh, and if, there are many reasons for doing that. If you know how to calculate, and the question will be how complex or how difficult this calculation is. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be describing it in a second. Uh, well, we, we of course expect it in general to be very difficult. 
And the reason I'm focusing on that is because if you know how to solve partition function, you can solve all other problems. And uh, two fundamental other problems which are important are listed in here. Maximum likelihood, and let's remember what, what, I, was, what I needed to calculate in the coding case. And uh, marginal probability, right? Probability of uh, this particular edge connecting those two particles, so th these particles to be in the relations. Suppose I want to calculate this object. Both those characteristics, they follow from what we call partition function. Partition function is also uh, another discipline in computer science is of course associated with counting. So we have, uh, you might just count number of configurations which are uh, allowed. Or you might have a weighted counting configuration. Each configuration enters with a certain probability. And that's what partition function is. So very important option. So now, uh, in terms of complexity, uh, you ask question like, how many iterations are required to create graphical model? By evaluating, I mean, calculate partition function, find uh, maximum likelihood and marginal probability. Uh, what is exact algorithm? What is the complexity of that algorithm? And if uh, exact algorithm is too difficult, exponential complexity, what is approximate algorithm? Right, and already said, more or less, well, uh, I'm not putting it in a mathematical frame, but kind of just, just intuition behind that. Uh, so difficult means exponential in complexity, to me the common and easy uh, might mean, depending on application, is algebraic and in the allowance power. Or, or, and, well, of course, we would like to have it linear, and then, then it's much better. Uh, so I'm using, of course, very loose, loose definitions of all of that, but that, that's, 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 that's my task. So I want to just access how, how difficult or difficult problem is. And, uh, okay, so, uh, Normally, when you have program uh, stated uh, in this form, and you expect that some majority of problems are difficult, and many, some of them, very few of them, may be easy, it would be very useful to classify, or try to identify problems which are easy. And uh, this is a list of some problems which are easy, of course, incomplete. Most important for the subject of this talk, there are actually two of them are most important. So first of all, uh, any problem on the tree is easy. Any reconstruction problem that I have, by any, I mean, partition function, finding partition function, weighted counting, or finding maximum likelihood. Uh, and uh, that's a very important uh, statement, and it's a relatively easy statement to make, but kind of fundamental for, for using for us using uh, belief propagation. Uh, belief propagation is actually a term which was introduced in artificial intelligence. Uh, by incident, uh, there is approximation coming from physics, which is called beta piles approximation. It's also BP, and it's very much related. So we use BP for most. Uh, okay, and well, other problems which some of you may know, for example, 2 sub is easy. Uh, XOR sub, which is related to binary symmetric channel decoding, is easy. Uh, many, uh, well, some class of integer programming, which are used through total modularity to linear programming, are easy. There is no gap between, between uh, integer programming and linear programming. Uh, and uh, for, well, I was discussing matching, minimal perfect matching, this problem of finding most probable matching is actually easy and it's solved uh, in a sort of Hungarian algorithm. And that's important for me uh, for the purpose of this talk. Now, but quite generally, uh, and studying, well, emphasizing this first point, that uh, problem, any problem is easy on the team, any problem is like uh, When you account for loops, uh, you immediately get in trouble. Uh, and uh, these loops, the problem in general becomes difficult. And that's actually uh, what, uh, what, what many people realize in many disciplines, and that's what, what is behind uh, all these massive classes. In spite of the fact that it's difficult, you still want to, you know, difficult in general, you still want to apply it. What you know works perfectly in the case of a tree without loops. So let me tell you briefly why it is. Uh, it is exact on the key. So if you have a tree, that reference here goes to uh, Burton Piles, famous physicist, and they wrote two papers, not algorithmic at all, and it wasn't complete. I think better paper was on melting lattices. Uh, so it was a kind of first type of paper, first, one of the first phase transition paper in, in the physics literature. But uh, some technique which was used in this paper, so some, some thinking which was used in this paper, is very much related to that. That's why I put this question. And those references are actually more properly given down. But now, uh, uh, consider a tree. And I want to calculate partition function. I want to count. And I use just my notation of graphical model. 
and what you can observe. So of course, if you naively approach this, this task, you have sum over all possible configurations, and a number of edges, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, you have two in the power, two in the power five uh, configuration. Uh, but that's naive counting. So let's see how we can do it better. Well, uh, but it works only on the key. So what you do, you introduce uh, partitions. You introduce uh, subgraphs. Uh, blue subgraph, red subgraph, and then there is this green which combines. And uh, you define those partition functions, those counting uh, characteristics for uh, those subgraphs. So, uh, and this uh, object, they depend on the, by defining any of those uh, objects, yes? Could it, could it be do me a favor and state what is a, a node in your graph and what is an edge? Somehow I... All right, uh, right, 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 sure, sure. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, no, <laughs> um, so my variable sits on edges. Uh, so my variables are binary. Uh, and uh, <coughs> my functions, those Fs, uh, are associated with nodes. And nodes uh, represent the relation between variables which sit on edges. And uh, these relations may be, uh, it may be just, just some function, probability, or maybe a constraint. And constraint would be that, uh, let's say, uh, this edge uh, can be in state one, uh, but uh, then uh, this state, uh, this a another edge adjusted to this vertex uh, cannot be in state zero, let's say. Okay? The graph is undirected? Uh, graph is undirected. Graph is undirected, yes. So it's a relation graph. Uh, it's graph expressing, uh, basically, uh, as I said before, so there is this very nice configuration, but overall, uh, any configuration of those edges, you can think of coloring edges, right? So edge, uh, if, if it is zero, it's not, uh, if it is plus one, it is colored, if it is minus one, it is not colored. For any configuration of those colorings, I have a weight associated with this configuration. Probability, which is not yet normalized, and I want to calculate this probability. So the message is really the incorporation of several edges into the node. Uh, the well, uh, we'll, we'll come to message, yes. But uh, so far I'm, I didn't use this, you know, messages in here. Okay, and the issue of course is when you have uh, loops. If it was a tree, it would be uh, Well, uh, but let's see why it is uh, the tree. I always, yeah, you, you had me uh, a bit. Uh, yeah, but uh, overall, uh, you, ex you, you define those, uh, you define sub, uh, uh, sub graphs. And subgraphs, in the case of a T, they always, uh, when you define it, uh, there is one edge cut, right? Always like that, but only if you have a T. And therefore, those objects which are uh, partition function uh, defined my subgraphs, they always depend only on one external variables, which I'm not fixing, but I'm summing over all other variables which are inside my subgraph. And then I discovered that uh, this uh, bigger subgraph, which is in green, uh, my partition function, this bigger subgraph, can be expressed through this partition function that goes to it, right? So there is this very s simple uh, straightforward relation which is written down in here. And then you can go, go further and further and uh, you will get a set of relations. And uh, it's actually, um, well, uh, it's not only a set of relations, of course, it's how you will solve this problem. You will go from peripheral, from, from leaves to the center of your, and center of Italy being fine, and uh, you'll basically solve this problem, find the partition function of the tree in, in just one, one direction. You go from peripheral, you go to the center, and that's it. And you can always think of it uh, as a set of relations between those uh, new objects. In other words, uh, you, instead of counting, you replace your problem by resolving a uh, set of equations. On the tree, those equations, they just one follow from another. You do it in an iterative way. <coughs> uh, and uh, in general, if you, in general, it's not justified, right? In general, you cannot uh, apply this procedure. But when you derive those equations on the tree, and you write them in an invariant way, and here there are those vectors, which are objects, continuous variables associated with edges, which, which we now call messages, and uh, so it is nonlinear equation, the way it's written, uh, which can be solved iteratively in a very simple way on the tree. But uh, because it is written in a variant way, you can think about applying it for graph without these loops, not necessarily. The and that's what it is. Uh, you, uh, it's heuristics, 
uh, that's how it was originally introduced. Which is justified on a tree, which is not justified in general. Uh, but you expect it to work reasonably well in the case where uh, there are not that many loops. Okay, just, just on a intuitive level. And that's more or less what Gallagher uh, was, was thinking when he introduced this type of uh, decoding, or this type of solving this problem of reconstruction, uh, or OLDPC code in 61. Very similar ideas in spin glass physics uh, a bit later, then uh, Perl, uh, and of course many people laughed at him in machine learning, and well, it, it percolated in many disciplines, but always people have been thinking more or less along those lines. Something which, is, which you, can done, you can do very easily on the tree, just try to apply it uh, to graphs with loops, to your problem formulated on the graphical model formulated with loops, and well, it's heuristic. Uh, a bit later, it was also recognized, and that's mainly uh, came from uh, this work by uh, Edidia Freeman and Weiss. Uh, it's a very interesting group. Edidia is physicist and uh, Freeman and Weiss a uh, computer scientist. Uh, and uh, what, what they discovered, they discovered this set of equations which you, which you see in here, which you saw in here, which you need to solve in general uh, on, a, on, a, on a graph, on a multi graph. Uh, actually emerge, uh, you can understand them as a result of solving optimization problem. And um, uh, the way of thinking which led uh, them to this uh, variational formulation is more or less as follows. So you start from the distribution function which, which, which you saw uh, over here in mind. So that, that's, uh, you don't know Z, but otherwise you know this uh, probability of any configuration. And then you start thinking in terms of proxies for your probabilities, what we call beliefs, those are beats. And in this, uh, and you, you formulate, you compare measures, right? You compare B and you compare P. And the well, of course, is this very simple statement that uh, if, you, if this function or function of all those beliefs, and there are exponentially many of those beliefs, because I have exponentially many state signals, right? Uh, well, uh, if I minimize this function on the condition that my beliefs all sum to 1 and all in, in 0 and 1 because they are probabilities, then I'll get that B is equal to P. That's kind of almost trivial statement, and that's kublik ladder type of statement. This function is convex, it's nice, it's all. Uh, but also, you can uh, immediately recognize that you can formally use this type of uh, variational approach. Uh, optimization approach for calculating partition function. It, it's, it doesn't help because you still have too many of those variables. But in the next step, you start thinking, okay, if, if I formulate it as a continuous optimization, so advantage of this uh, reformulation is now it becomes continuous. It's stated in terms of beliefs, probabilities. Before it was just counting discrete, discrete problem, right? Uh, once I formulate it as a continuous optimization, how about uh, trying to approximate it, trying to massage it, and one way of doing it is reducing uh, space uh, which I want to explore. So not go through all possible P of sigmas, but constrain it in some way. And then, uh, constraint which actually is exact, is absolutely kosher, uh, uh, but only on the tree, uh, is written in, the, in here. Okay, so what is this constraint? I introduce instead of my belief associated with any configuration sigma, uh, I express it uh, through marginal probabilities. Uh, I, I introduce those two characteristics, and that is written for a particular case of tracking. So there is this uh, i, which is index for uh, first image, and j is index for my second image. And uh, there is a probability that my uh, uh, probability uh, for my uh, particle from the first image to be connected to some number of particles in the second image, so bi. And similarly, probability uh, b associated with particles in the second image, and this is also bij, a marginal probabilities for, for all edges. Point is that it's very special, very strange looking uh, expression for my probability. It doesn't hold in general. However, it is exact on the three. On the three, full probability, full distribution function is factorized. Uh, and that, that can be shown. So all this consideration which I was showing you uh, on the case, in the case of a tree uh, actually uh, goes through. If I substitute this as an ansatz in my uh, Kubler-Kleiber functional, 
I am getting what we now call uh, beta free energy. And this beta free energy, uh, and I want to minimize my beta free energy. Uh, and this is already approximation. So now minimization of this beta free energy uh, will result in the set of equations which, which you saw on the previous slide, which are called beta uh, propagation equations. Okay? Uh, so that's that's kind of additional new twist, uh, which uh, which is relatively recent, ten years old, uh, which allowed to to view belief propagation uh, much from much broader perspective than before. Before it was just heuristics and it was just iterative way of solving uh, belief propagation equations. A message passing uh, is uh, is an iterative way of solving those equations, which which is, which is written down in here. Equations are non linear, you need to initiate, uh, you, need to, you want to, to find address messages which satisfy all those equations. And you have as many equations as number, number of vertices. And I have as many variables and uh, I'm sorry, I have as many of those equations as number of edges, and I have twice as many as number of edges. And I have uh, the same number of equations, but equations are non linear. Uh, and uh, there is a certain uh, iterative procedure which is exactly uh, equivalent to this iterative procedure of solving uh, this set of equations which, uh, which, which I was telling you about in the fee, but I apply it in general. So now, uh, this optimization framework uh, actually allows you to think about uh, this problem not in terms of a concrete iterative algorithm, but much broad, right? So you have optimization problem. How exactly are you going to this minimal, this functional? Well, you can do it in various ways, in particular through this particular uh, sort of algorithm, which is which is classical message passing algorithm. It maybe means some algorithm or some products or other medium. But it also allows you to play with this distributed algorithm. OK. Um, I'll not tell you about the story uh, which allows you to understand the propagation as a, uh, in a relate to exact inference. So there is a story which you call uh, loop calculus. Uh, it actually uh, allows you to relate uh, exact object, exact partition function to a uh, partition function which will be calculated within this approximation, which is called belief propagation approximation. And by this approximation, I know mean uh, getting the minimum of this beta free energy. Uh, and uh, it is uh, basically a relation uh, which is still not resolving. Of course, uh, my problem is still difficult, uh, but it expresses all those corrections in terms of it's a, a sum of, a, uh, of a loops, and the loops are certain subgraphs of this graph, and for any uh, subgraph, you have a concrete expression if you already solve this bit of propagation. So I'll not be telling you that just because I don't have much time left, uh, but if, if it will be, so, so that's a theory uh, I'm working on, and theory behind many of the things which we want to do, and plan to do in the future. Uh, but just wanted to put it in any case. So now uh, I also wanted to advertise a workshop which I'm co-organizing a should be at Princeton at the Center for Computational Complexity. It will be in early November, where many of those, uh, so I'm representing one corner of the story, kind of physics corner. There's a computational complexity corner, there is a information theory corner, and uh, all those are co-organizers, uh, my co-organizers, uh, and uh, please, please check this website. Yeah. Does that the Does that the uh, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, the director. Oh no, no, I don't actually know who is director. So it's in the yeah. center of the center. Yeah. He was he was in my first in the day. So in any case, so now let me. Uh, uh, can I can I talk for another five minutes? Uh, uh, how much time do you have? So it's usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let me now tell you how you can use this video propagation recording and how you can go with it later. Yes. Yeah, I, I want to ask. So for trees, I think it's pretty intuitive why it works. But uh, and, and the fact that you can mathematically generalize it, okay, you can. But what is the test of validity? Why why this uh, this is uh, well. Uh, Okay, um, that's actually why I can believe that this exact formula, which I didn't explain to you of why why it holds, may be useful. Uh, so what basically this formula tells you uh, is that if you uh, can estimate this as the rest, one is what, what this belief propagation as an approximation gives you. And then there are all those corrections. 
which you, if you calculate it already with the propagation, you can also access. Uh, still too many of them, exponentially many, but uh, explicit formulas for all of them. So uh, test of validity would be a statement that all of them are much smaller than one in some asymptotic sense. And that's, uh, in some cases, what we succeeded to, to show. Uh, but uh, in general, it's not valid. <laughs> in general, it's not valid. So it's, uh, it's a good heuristics, uh, but if you want, uh, well, in some cases, it's asymptotic, it's asymptotic curve. And then, if, if this is the case, then you need to, to look at those corrections and estimate those corrections. But in many practical cases, those corrections will be basically not small, and then, well, then it will not be valid, uh, theoretically speaking. But not only that, then you, uh, when you get to the opportunity, you start the loop. Uh, that's right. Well, uh, another direction, then, if it is not valid, then you can go into up to those loops. Right? So there are those corrections which, which, which are significant, if they are significant, then you can try to identify which corrections are more important. And that gives you a way to improve the belief propagation. Now, there, there are many, many directions you can go from there. It's by no means a you know, closed subject in terms of a you know, statement made. I think it's, in mathematical sense, it's rather the beginning of the story. <laughs> and it's what, what, what will be discussed. It's what we call a loop is a new model. Uh, well, um, so for any, well, Loops in this case, we call actually should, should call it we call it generalized loops. A subgraphs uh, of our graph uh, is all nodes uh, of degree two or larger. So there are no loose ends. But if, if you would have a tree, there are no corrections at all. For tree, there are no loops. Mm -hmm. Right. But whenever whenever you have you know loopy graph, then you have corrections, and in general, you have exponentially many corrections, but still fine. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technique which supposedly should help you to A, access uh, validity of the propagation, and B, if it is not valid, you can prove it. Let me, let me uh, tell you, uh, maybe you know, uh, since I don't have much time left, uh, there are two stories, right? So one is this error flow story. An error flow story, uh, so belief propagation is used as a way of decoding. Uh, but mainly uh, the story which we uh, which we've been busy is uh, is a story of resolving this error flow, finding uh, what we call the most probable, most dangerous pseudo could go, uh, which which is in charge for this error flow. There is this understanding that uh, this change in performance of our, of, of, uh, of the code, uh, so you go from waterfall to error flow, is because it is some very bad pseudo could work. Pseudo could work is where you decode. Um, um, we decode, uh, but it's not it's not a code word. Uh, and as I already said, it's ray event analysis, life deviation analysis. Let, let me skip this part and just jump to uh, this particle tracking part, just because we were a lot of time. Um, okay, so now uh, inference and learning by uh, passing messages between images, that's how we, uh, we call it. So there are those two images, and uh, I superimpose them on the top of each other. Uh, and uh, this velocity configuration is just shown for your you know, eye guidance, right? So that's what I, I don't see in reality, but that's what I want to reconstruct. So I want to reconstruct uh, those lines, and I want to understand how my velocity will actually uh, look like, uh, just at looking at those two images. Okay? And what, what I do, as I already said, I pose this problem as inference problem, a reconstruction problem. This is my uh, probability, this is my graphical model. The graphical model in this case uh, is, a, uh, is a fully connected, it's a fully connected bipartite graph. And uh, all my physics enters on those coefficients pijs. And uh, those coefficients pijs uh, uh, are parameterized by low parametric uh, characteristics which are, uh, well, three components of velocity gradient and the <coughs> coefficient. So now, why uh, on Earth would I use belief propagation? I'll be using belief propagation. Why on Earth would I be uh, using belief propagation if my graph is not sparse? Right? Because I was, all, all my you know, discussions so far, I was telling you that, well, if graph is sparse, is if it is tree-like, close to tree, it's good to use belief propagation. But this graph is not, not sparse. Well, there is a very good reason for doing that. And, uh, and the reason is, is stated in here, 
Uh, and uh, this perfect matching problem, which I was telling you, uh, and so there is an algorithm for solving this perfect matching. This algorithm, uh, first algorithm, which was suggested for the problem, is famous for Hungarian algorithm. Uh, then uh, you can rephrase, of course, repose this algorithm in terms of linear programming. And this linear programming is, a, is of this special type. When, uh, well, integer linear programming you start from, you can relax it to normal linear programming, and there's no gap. So that, that's what is special about perfect matching. Now remember my belief propagation, I stated in the optimization. I was telling you that there is this belief propagation should be understood as a minimization of a functional, which is called beta free energy function. But this functional was nonlinear. Now, in this functional, uh, there is a linear part and a linear part, and then there are all those constraints. Constraints are relations between marginal probability, because uh, all this optimization, belief propagation was stated in finding those marginal beliefs. So now, if you, if you ignore those, um, uh, for the problem of maximum likelihood, that's what you can do. If you ignore nonlinearities, which are associated with entropy terms, P log B type. You are getting linear programming, and you can show that this linear program which you are getting in the belief propagation we have seen uh, is equivalent to linear programming which, which is exact for this problem. There is this remarkable observation that goes uh, back to this paper by Yeti Shah and Sharma. And uh, it's not what I need to do here. I need to calculate partition function, which was America speaking is a program of finding permanent. Permanent of my matrix and matrix constructed of most transition probabilities which comes from my, my physics modeling. Uh, but if I would be to find maximum likelihood, I can use the repropagation. So that's uh, it's not a full justification, but that's just intuition behind why we use the repropagation. And the uh, repropagation for problem of maximum likelihood is exact in this case. Belief propagation is in the proper proper way through uh, optimization, through linear programming version. Actually, on the coding side of the wall, we call it LPD coding, and uh, it, it is a. We, we, we like to think about it as a version of the propagation. But uh, that, that's that's why we use the propagation in here. And uh, uh, well, uh, it's basically a heuristic test which we perform uh, with this idea, and uh, we wanted to reconstruct those three coefficients, and those are coefficients for velocity gradient. And what I, what I show here is a test with 400 particles in this two-dimensional two images. And uh, you want to learn those coefficients A, B, and C. And uh, those are, uh, um, well, perfect matching, which is reconstructed. And those are uh, particular values which were reconstructed. So we assume uh, actual values were, well, as shown in here, for those three coefficients. And the reconstructed values were uh, relatively close. So that, that's a particular particular uh, test experiment which I'm showing in here. And uh, maybe most interesting part in terms of, again, developing uh, heuristic simulations. Uh, as I told you, we use belief propagation equations, belief propagation for finding this partition function. But then our learning problem is to maximize this partition function with respect to those low dimensional C3 parameters. And that's how we find it. But because we can pose the propagation with optimization problems itself, we basically have a combined optimization problem. Uh, and that's how we solve it. So it's not that we solve it in uh, you know, one problem first, and the reconstruction of the given value of uh, parameters, and then optimize parameters, but we combine it. So it was one optimization problem. It's actually very fast. And uh, well, as, as, as we showed in the test, very, very efficient. Uh, and uh, we uh, did prove theoretically that this algorithm converges, but in test it was converging. And actually, it looks like uh, the whole um, optimization which we deal with in here is actually convex, but we don't know yet how it works. And uh, that is yet another test, and that's uh, basically to show that the yeah, construction is perfect. Uh, and um, there are many, many things which we, we can do. There are some. Uh, for this particular physics application, uh, we didn't have enough of a theory uh, to, to show the asymptoticism, show asymptotic validity but for some synthetic model, which are uh, what we call random distance models, which are very much related to random matching problems, which comes back to Parisian artwork and the spin last theory. We can, we, can, we can do asymptotic statements. Our algorithm, reconstruction algorithm, is asymptotic. Uh, 
it's physics statement, it's not mathematics statement. So to make it mathematics, it's, you know, some work needs to be done. But uh, we do believe that for some models, uh, we can show that this type of reconstruction is totally correct. Uh, and, uh, well, there are many, many extensions of this work, in particular, we want to reconstruct much more difficult philosophical laws. And uh, we, we want to go beyond the propagation, etc., etc., etc. I guess bottom line for this talk, uh, so application of the propagation uh, and is distributed uh, iterative realization. Of course, I forgot to mention that message passing, we like it I mean, in the first place because it is distributed. Because the way you solve those nonlinear equations, you solve it in a, you know, communicating messages between, uh, uh, between nodes and those, uh, you know, you do it locally and you, you can parallelize that. Uh, now, uh, application of this algorithm are diverse, and there are many. There are, there are plenty of you know, uh, applications where you can go with this type of techniques. And they work not only uh, when uh, you have a sparse structure behind, there are many other cases where it, uh, it's, it basically works strikingly in other cases where you can formulate your problem with the rest of model. And then, if it works, then there should be some reason for that, and it's, there is a way, there is a technique for to figuring it out. Uh, and uh, well, there are of course many other techniques which you can kind of combine into that. Uh, very often for counting and inference, we also use Markov chain type of techniques. They are not related to belief propagation, at least not, not related today, but supposedly there are a lot of very complementary those other techniques, stochastic techniques. And there is a lot of synergy potentially, especially, well, we, I expect a lot of synergy in the future between those two techniques. They, they really, uh, one may be, may be much better than another, is one regime and other way around. And uh, yeah, so I, there are many, many references. Uh, my book and some book of other people which you can find on this web page. And um, there are many parts, well, there are, there are many things which, which uh, we are doing uh, in this general context, kind of merging and combining ideas from physics and computations and inference learning, etc. Thank you. And sorry to be So we have time for questions. It actually was comment not about uh, my work, but uh, this is approach which is uh, now becoming very popular and it applies uh, to problems where you consider not one graph but a family of random graphs and you average uh, over a family of random graphs. In physics, uh, mainly in Parisian or also Parisian methods, they develop uh, kind of very useful techniques for solving it. But those techniques uh, were not proved uh, be correct, but they kind of there is some intuition to handle these things, and this is still out in terms of mathematical proofs. But uh, in, in few cases, and very recent, actually, the story behind all this Parisian is a and uh, uh, random graph uh, computations uh, is 30 years old. Uh, but only very recently, uh, some of those statements are true, uh, and th that's what I was referring to. And it's, it, it doesn't doesn't apply to my story of uh, calculating smooth calculus, doing calculations, doing uh, developing calculations for concrete graph. It's rather about analysis and uh, asymptotic analysis in the case of very large graph and for some ensemble of random graphs. Does people mean that you're taking the physical reality as a proxy? Well, uh, it's been done by physicists. Uh, well, uh, the spin glass, the answer is yes. yes. Well, but in other physics, beyond the spin glass, right? uh, but well, it's prototypical. Uh, in spin glass, uh, the ba uh, well, the basic level, where what's called is without this replica symmetry, when replica symmetry is there. Well, it is this terminology, that, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. So I'm not discussing it here, but it, it is a terminology come from physics. When there is a replica symmetry uh, level, and then there are, uh, you can break the symmetry. And uh, there are some computations done in the replica symmetric case, which are not necessarily always correct. 
And then when they are not correct, then there is this understanding that you need to break symmetry in a proper way. And how to break it is yet another step. So that's a kind of physical way of thinking. But uh, in, on a replica symmetric case, uh, it's basically the idea is uh, to make uh, belief propagation in a statistical sense. So this idea uh, that uh, you don't have loops that do not configure uh, means that uh, effect of loops but if they are not contributing with those, there are loops in reality. Uh, it it, it comes from the fact that, well, there is some, uh, in the result of average, of proper average, if you do it correctly, this uh, loop contribution kind of cancel out. Uh, to prove it is extremely difficult. The proof is not, not trivial, and, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm arguing that some of those proofs can be actually done with the help of this technique, which, which we are selling, loop calculus. But in general, it's very difficult, and it's not how, how it's done. Uh, basically, there is no general you know, way. I don't believe the, all those statements coming from spin glass, uh, community and physics statements. So, it, they were just guessed. They guessed on the, on the intuition. And intuition was always uh, a lack of contribution coming from loops, or maybe if there is some contribution coming from loops, kind of express it in a very calm. Compact, right? No, no, but there the, the fact that the loops do not contribute comes from physical intuition. Uh, because if you go far away, the, 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 the interaction is weak and all that stuff. Okay? Where in general, not only from there, there but also from the fact that uh, yeah. those loops are kind of, there may be some contribution from loop, but they kind of cancel out. Uh, in general, need, mathematical problems, you cannot have that. That's why you need to prove. That's what he's asking. Right. Another question? Yeah, yeah um, so have you seen Pascal Pantelos? That the, the, the perfect matching the probability is actually using back context? Uh, yes, uh, and that's very recent and it's very nice and it's correct. Does so it basically, uh, well, uh, I, I put this statement in here. Uh, well, convergence of my algorithm. But actually, uh, with this Pascal recent uh, result, it really will help. Uh, well, if you're interested in the subject, you really need to come to this Princeton workshop. Yeah, the majority I'll try of us get some. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, it will be probably the whole day uh, devoted to computation of permanent with uh, belief propagation. Okay. And uh, uh, Pascal showed that this beta free energy, which you need to minimize uh, to solve belief propagation equation, in the case of permanent, when you apply this procedure to permanent, is convex. This convexity is very non trivial. Mm -hmm. so actually, I, I first didn't think it is convex <laughs> uh, when I saw it. Uh, Moreover, this loop calculus thing which I'm telling you about has a very complex and very nice way in the case of permanence. So permanence are a very special type of graphical models and uh, I mean, the calculation of permanence uh, allows a lot of simplification uh, and uh, those simplifications uh, you know, uh, can, can, you know, can allow you to, to do uh, much better than belief propagation. But also belief propagation is surprisingly good. Uh, there is also a paper of Gurwitz Leonid Gurwitz recently, Leonid is a mathematician also from Los Alamos, who actually proved, uh, in general, belief propagation. If, if you look at this formula, which, uh, right, this loop calculus formula. Uh, in general, you can, uh, those corrections uh, may be positive or negative. And uh, if you able to show that all of them are positive, it's not, in general, it's not the case. Uh, then, of course, you have a uh, low bound in terms of belief propagation. So belief propagation is proved the low bound. In the case of permanent, they are not positive. So they are sign and kinetic. However, you can show that some of them uh, is positive. And therefore, belief propagation, uh, in the case of computing permanent, uh, is, uh, gives you low bound. Uh, this is very uh, non trivial result. In the case, Gurwitz proved it based on some some other, some other theory coming from mathematics of permanence. Uh, it's very kind of, well, in his paper it looks easy, but uh, if you go to this other paper, which he's citing is actually very combinatorial, very kind of graphic, you know, rich, uh, I frankly don't understand it. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of recent, well, it's very recent, a few, few well, last months. Is Time for a question. Or yeah, yeah. So, uh, you argue that uh, this approach is attractive because it's distributed and therefore parallel. Uh, but uh, the parallel you have here is extremely irregular. 
Yeah, this is not the parallelism that current machines support as well. Probably not. Uh, yeah. Has it been, what is the record of implementing it at all uh, in today's machine? Well, um, I'm not the best person to answer this question, but as far as I, my understanding is that uh, in, a, in the case of decoding, uh, there are iterative algorithms which are built in uh, FPGA, in, uh, FPGA uh, hardware, which are basically uh, Tom Richardson and, uh, well, they're now acquired uh, by Qualcomm, but what is it? Clarion. Clarion, right. So they, they That's built, a they, they built, yeah. uh, they built uh, a decoder based on this type of yeah, but okay. This is an extremely inefficient way because if the FPGA is the mother of the regular ones as opposed to the irregular. So if you throw in a lot of hardware, you can make it work, but then most of it remains unused. No, you can actually make a special type of hardware. I don't think this is an issue. But that's not the essence of the problem. This is the problem I have to solve a, a graph optimization problem, all right? And how do I do it when the main thing I have to compute is equivalent computation to computing Z, which is... The point is that it, it works on a graph, and the graph... No, it doesn't work on a graph in general. I'm sorry? It does not work in a graph in general. All this, well, this stuff is heuristics. There are the actual proofs, all right, for approximations, all right? No, no, I mean, whatever, I, clearly, I'm not saying that it works on any graph. It's not solved because of this expression. No, I'm not right? saying that it works on any graph. It works on, on some graphs. Yeah. The graph is given to you. It's different from one problem to the other, which makes it irregular because it's not. It well, no, 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 you're, you're, you're right. But usually you're talking about, okay, in the case of decoding, uh, let me clarify that. Uh, you're talking about one graph because it is one code. Okay, so it's a decoder. Well, how to select this code is a whole, whole different story, but it's one graph. What is changing are those functions f's, uh, but graph is the same. Uh, it, it, it makes I it so you can, implementable you can in the hardware. Oh, so now I'm not saying, I, I guess, yeah, uh, you cannot probably, what you're saying is you cannot construct general purpose uh, you know, parallel scheme for any graphical models like that. Probably not, certainly not. And I actually don't know, we didn't even start thinking about how to parallelize it in the case of particle tracking. And so it will be, it will yeah. be a, a, so another special that, issue, yeah. probably very non-trivial. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there I, I believe I have some ideas there. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, question. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, I mentioned at um, some point that the calculation is converged, and you don't have any theoretical proof. To uh, no, but that's, uh, that's related to this other question about uh, uh, oh, uh, so, uh Computing permanent is really used to optimization, and optimization is complex, and that was shown very recently, which means uh, that a properly defined iterative algorithm, and most probably the one which we're using, just standard value propagation algorithm, will converge. So we tested in, uh, in simulations. We didn't try to prove it, but all those results about convexity are recent. So I bet the next step for Pascal and probably for others will be to prove it, <laughs> but it's not yet proven. Um, and, well, if you have convex optimization, right, you, you can find uh, well, that's at least my name, maybe a bit naive, but uh, physics optimization. There exists a there, there exists algorithm, and this probably the experience in optimization but theory, you can find this in I mean, you know, if you know consensus problems, we have convergence and consensus, consensus problems, but they are doubly exponential in the number of nodes, so basically, basically useless. But you can have convergence. The speed is important. Yeah, so there is this, uh, well, in this community, which is a relatively new community, and people are coming from different directions. There are some uh, some people in this community, like Del uh, from MIT, and Sekar uh, Tadekwan, that focus exactly on that type of problems. Uh, they uh, try to design the iterative algorithm which converges to this minimum battery free energy in a provably, you know, kosher way, in a good way. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying it's trivial, it's very non-trivial. Well, but how many steps? And is it, is it yeah, given yeah, us? Yeah. Oh, no, no, okay. Well, yeah, really, uh, yeah, 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 so a number of steps, so complex steps. Uh, I have one question. Who, 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 um, actually, two. Why this has not been connected to Markov Ranofield algorithms yet? Uh, 
Oh, it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> because, I mean, well, Mark, it so begs the question, I, right? It, it isn't this perfect matching problem or particle training. Uh, we, when we, uh, we make an experimental statement that algorithm works, we need to compare it with exact proxy, for example. We use, we use Mark chain algorithm. Right, but I mean, all these, gates, all these gate transformations are basically measure transformations of the Markov random field. And then what, all you do is you redistribute the probability to make a calculation fast. But I haven't seen this even done. No, no, I, I agree with you. And that's why I'm saying there's a lot of potential synergy between. Uh, I, uh, or non synergy. So, uh, <laughs> what, why do physicists do not try to understand that language in use? If I can be Well, uh, physicists are usually very sloppy. So whenever you're getting a result, uh, you don't try to. Because the big machinery you, want to, uh, you just run. Uh, big machinery of Markov random field to write condition of Markov random field is all kind of machinery that they are not just Markov chain, they are extensions of that specifically constructed for graphs to use the locality in the mathematics. But I haven't seen that connection for this reason. Question number one. Question number two, what is known for the particle tracking problem when I have multiple snapshots and okay. Is there an iterative algorithm to do that? Because Very good. Uh, if I want to understand if the flow, interest here, we can collaborate, and I hope. Uh, no, no. I mean, if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm trying to find a vector field, right? It behooves me to try to get several samples well, and then fit not just two and then. No, two. no, absolutely, absolutely. So it's it's of course only first step. Yeah. Uh, in general, this uh, well, uh, there is a whole field of tracking, right? So uh, sure. we try well uh, using tracking for this PID for this fluid mechanic experiment is. Is relatively, it's new, I, I don't think anybody else discussed. Uh, but there are plenty of other applications where, and even in this application, of course, it's, it's moody, so it's, it will be, and of course, it's not smart enough to use information from previous state, and probably you can, uh, you, you, you may certainly generalize all of that and uh, involve multiple images. Or do block at least. Now, do block, you know, there are so many things. Or do you this, can, you know, one block and another do. block and another block and another block and another block and another all of that should be anyway, done. And there are predictive algorithms for particle tracking that use previous information to predict where to look for next. Uh, it, so, okay, so there are algorithms, but usually for individual particles. Right, so that, that's that's what people mainly focus on. So individual particles, and here uh, we put into the game this you know, multi particle picture and uh, we make it kind of complex from that perspective as well. So, uh, what, what do you mean for individual particles? So, uh, so for Lot of trajectories for different particles. No, lot of trajectories for different particles altogether. together. I'm looking at the entire picture okay, and trying to estimate where every bed point, not just one. So the trajectories of every bed, every particle. And you don't want them to cross and other things, right? I guess that's the. Well, uh, in this particular case, uh, no, but probably. Well, in this particular case, your particles do not interact. So those are just, you know, markers. Uh, there are probably applications where your particles are ideal. And you know, the other question direction. I have, which again, mathematics, okay, I mean, at least for people that I, I interact with, very quickly they get into uh, cohomology theory and cycles and uh, synthesis and stuff like that. And I haven't seen any of that. This, 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 uh, this, this group of people is not using this part of mathematics at all. And I think it's why. It's not. Uh, well, they're not, but uh, actually. Uh, well, and it's quite natural, right? I mean, you talk about loops probably, and loops and stuff like that, and these things have agree, very precise terms, and they are used, and they, are, they explain what's happening. I mean, if you look at the work of Smith and others, and graphs, and the guy from Stanford. I agree. And I agree. Uh, for that matter, maybe uh, I didn't have time to mention it, uh, but since it looks like we just have a yeah. few fun discussion. Uh, there is another very uh, much related subject, subject of planar and surface graphs. Uh, apparently, uh, if you graph, you can put it on a plane. Uh, there are many interesting simplifications. In some cases, uh, partition function can be calculated explicitly. Exactly. Actually, for calculating this, uh, counting perfect matchings on a planar graph uh, is reduced <coughs> to determine. Yeah. And that's very non trivial statement, so you can use it. So, now why mentioning in a kind of response to your question? Because if you generalize it to surface graphs, graphs which are embedded in the surface is a relatively low genus. So there is some, and of course it's very much topology based, uh, uh, considerations which are already in the recent literature, but very recent. In the last uh, year, but the, you're right. So there are in the last two years, years there have been tremendous excitement for the so-called topological elements in, in machine, in, in, in finding uh, things. 
in related databases to the domain. Totally topological, right? Large graphs that explain the relationships with data, and by just understanding the topology of the relationship, you can come up with algorithms that they find things very quickly. That is the last two years, right? Uh, provided the graphs have a certain degree of sparsity. This has become precise, but all that kind of stuff, even, this, even when the data have statistical characterization, comes to very careful analysis of homology, cohomology, try to find cycles and things like that. And I think the very strong relationship, so possibly as a person that understands a few mathematics, okay, I, I am surprised that this has not lived here at all. Not, not your talk only, everybody. Uh, well, uh, well, I guess I'm surprised too, so it should be there, but it, it's, it's recent, it's all kind of... No, this is to develop This stuff has been on for 15, 20 years. Well, belief propagation was uh, kind of understood, and on the Sluby, the Sluby belief propagation, understood from, from uh, different corners. Um, only well, we don't. Anyway. Well, we probably need, well, we certainly don't understand it in full, but it, it's a story of last ten years. It reminds me, you know, how long it took us to understand the uh, the AM algorithm properties and whether it is really just uh, maximum likelihood or something else, and it, what is the approximation of it. And then in the end, you can write everything in five lines, convexity and proofs and everything. But it took a number of years because people were doing it blind. Well, there are a lot of a lot of stuff to do. Any other questions? Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.